And with that, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Noah. Thank you. I'm Noah. <clears throat> Uh, you've all seen that slide, so we'll move right along. So, uh, briefly, my background. Uh, I've been doing user experience and information visualization work for about the last five years or so since I uh, got a, a graduate degree at UW. Um, before that, I was a programmer for many years. I spent about five years every day writing regular expressions in Perl to munch data, which is occasionally useful, and I'm glad I'm not doing it anymore. Um, and a long time before that, I got a physics degree at Reed in Portland, so I've had a, a, a path of moving away from the technology, but um, still love to think about it. By the way, if you're jammed in the back and short and can't see, there's a lot of room in the front up on the side here. No keg in the front, though, eh? Um, I like a really interactive style of, of conversation, so if I speak too quickly or uh, blow past a point that you don't quite understand or think is interesting and want to hear more about or you have a question, uh, Raise your hand, yell it out, and, and uh, we'll, we'll address it. As incentive, we have a bunch of copies of this book, Beautiful Visualization. I'll be giving these away if you ask a good question. So don't sit on the question and then forget it. Um, this is the most recent thing I've been working on uh, professionally. This book came out this spring. I wrote the first chapter and was the technical editor along with the amazing Julie Steele, who's my co-editor. Um, a lot of the images in this talk actually are in the book. I don't feel bad about uh, plagiarizing the book at all because I worked on it. Um, I'm not pitching the book because I make money on it. There's no author royalties in the book. I just think it's a really, actually excellent book. So, there it is. Any questions? Go ahead. Um, could you explain your diagram? Yeah, um, sure. So, uh, I've, I've done a lot of different kinds of design, interface, user experience, whatever. Particularly, um, in, in terms of visualizations, I wrote a master's thesis on, on how to visualize data in, in a useful, constructive way. And the pieces that interest me, especially, are um, <coughs> complex things, which we'll talk about a little bit, and qualitative uh, representations of data. And qualitative I find interesting because a lot of the quantitative problems are solved problems. And there's not a lot of conventions yet for different qualitative solutions, so you have to invent a language and then you have to teach a language before you can start talking about data with people. So that's a, that's a good problem. Okay. So this is essentially a hierarchy of your... Uh, it's something, yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's a sentence diagram, I'm not sure. <laughs> All right, so um, <laughs> networks, 101. Networks are made up of nodes, and they are connected by links. Um, but we're not talking about networks today, we're talking about social networks. So um, social networks are just like Soylent Green. They're just networks, except they're made of people. So everybody with me so far? All right. So I'm going to talk a lot about networks or social networks. Uh, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's all going to be stuff um, with a connection. And what that connection is is going to vary a lot, and how you talk about that connection is going to vary a lot. And if you do that well or fail to do that well, you will have uh, succeeded or failed in your design. So um, there's a little bit of divide here. Visualization for analysis versus for presentation. Analysis is when you're really in investigative mode. You're not sure what you're going to find. Uh, you're doing research. You want to see what's there. So we've got this really, there's the laser, um, this kind of broad, maybe hazy end of the, of the spectrum. And you probably are dumping all of your data onto the screen so you can see relationships that you didn't expect. Right, so you can see what, what's emergent. Um, you're probably also not spending a lot of time polishing it because you're gonna say, oh, this is almost what we want, but you know what, we need to add more data points to it. Or what if we filter out everything except the last six months? And so if you're gonna iterate quickly and, and see what that gives you, um, not a lot of point in polishing it. The other end of the spectrum, and this is a continuum, I guess, not a spectrum, um, but notice there's not a hard divide here. The other end of the spectrum, visualization for presentation, you have a message, a particular message. And so you've got focus, there's not as much data here, and the data that you have is probably a little more coherent and a little more relevant. Um, and the, the visual treatment is going to be a lot more intentional and a lot more polished and uh, done in such a way as to convey the particular story that you're going to talk about. Um, so, you know, 60-ish or more percent of what I'm going to talk about is kind of more on the presentation end. It can apply to the analysis end, but... Um, the analysis end is sort of a little more of an open-ended question, whereas the presentation end, you have a, a point to convey. So um, that's what we're here for. Plagiarizing myself. The key to the success of any visual, beautiful or not, is providing access to information so the user can gain knowledge. Uh, it's remarkable <clears throat> how difficult it is to gain knowledge from a lot of the visualizations that are out there. Amen. Uh, right? <laughs> um, either because they are um, uh, poorly conceived, or they are poorly executed, or they're executed with aesthetics in mind rather than conveyance of knowledge. And like, that's fine if the aesthetics is, is, the, is the primary goal, but that's called art. 
right? And we're talking about technology. And you can combine the two. You can make very aesthetic visualizations that convey knowledge. But if the goal is to make it pretty before you talk about any kind of content, then it's really difficult to retrofit meaning into it. Um, whereas if you have nice structure and good meaning, the aesthetics is, is not hard to, to uh, bring into that as well. Question? No. Will you speak to intentional misleading? Oh, man. Have I got the slide for you? Okay. <laughs> uh, after the end of this, I'll put up one more slide that's not in this deck, and we'll, we'll uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's propaganda. I mean, that's the, the dark side, but it's all the same. <laughs> so um, briefly, just talking a little bit about complexity. This is a map of the internet from several years ago. Uh, there's, there's basically um, two kinds of data, right? This is immense, right? There's probably millions of nodes at this point. Uh, you have um, color coding for, for uh, top level domain, and you have connection. So this could be however many millions of nodes you want. There's still basically only two flavors of data, right? There's what domain is this particular point, and what's it connected to. So uh, not a lot of complexity there, not a lot of subtlety, not a lot of hard choices in terms of how do we represent this visually. You just uh, you know connect the dots, and that's about all that's going on. Um, that's not a horrible thing. But uh, if you've got more complex data and you get a very simple visualization of it or a not very complex visualization of it, there's a problem. And the problem either is that um, you don't understand your data very well or you're not representing it very well. And either of these is a fail because if you've got data and you can't convey it effectively, the data is worthless. So how to do it right? You know your data. What have you got? What is the knowledge that is embedded in the data? You may not know all the interesting things that are in the data, and that's when you go into the research mode. And, and learn what the data has to tell you. But if you've got all kinds of data about whens and wheres and all these other things, and all you're showing is the whats, uh, you're missing out on a lot of value, right? Every, uh, th th every data point you have is an opportunity to convey some more different kind of knowledge. And if you're not gonna represent it, if you're not gonna convey that knowledge, then the, the, you've lost value, effectively. So uh, there's a lot of examples here. I'm gonna go through the fail and then the win. Um, this is a map of, uh, starting at MySpace, all the different sites that people um, end up on from MySpace. Um, they're sort of color-coded by genre, and the thicker lines and closer one, there's more downloads, and then farther away with thinner lines, there's fewer downloads. So um, this isn't really a network. What this is is a, is, a, is a very broken bar graph that's all centered in one point. And it'd be a really a lot easier to understand if it was a bar graph, right? Because all we have all that these points are, there's a quantity and there's a genre, right? And a really good way to represent that's with a bar graph. The fact that they're all from MySpace, like that's the title. Downloads based from MySpace, right? Um, it doesn't have to be a graph. There's no network here. Uh, I mean, yes, everything originates from MySpace, but this is a fail, right? There's, there's no value added by doing it in this particular network format, except it makes it really hard to understand and hard to get any real data from. What you want is a table with numbers and maybe a bar graph so you can see the relative magnitudes, and that's it. And it's not as exciting as doing it as a network, but it's a lot more useful. So um, that's a fail. Here's a win. This is the London Underground map. This is a classic. It's not geographically accurate. I mean, it's kind of, you know, it's more or less accurate. But it's accurate enough to do the job, and it is simplified, is abstracted away from reality enough to make that easier and more accessible and to make the task that people have to do, which is to get from here to there, much more achievable than if it were 100% geographically accurate. So this is a situation where the, the relevance of the data, which is to say the logical connections between you know, any two stations, um, the important part is what are the connections between these two stations. When you're on the subway, what's your choice? Keep going or get off. Yeah, keep like, like I'm in a station, I can get off or, or not, right? Um, so you don't need a lot of detail about like how much the line wiggles between here and there and what side the escalator's on, like you're on the train. So uh, this abstraction is useful. This is a way that they have simplified the reality to make life easier. Good enough? Number two, pick a story. Um, this is where the transition from, from research to presentation uh, becomes interesting and also more difficult. It's difficult because you actually have to decide what it is you're going to represent and you're going to have to probably focus the visual presentation in a way to support that. So uh, here's a fail. This is one of the, um, 
uh, Facebook friend, whatever. So the story here is I know lots of people and some of them know each other. <laughs> I already knew that. There's not a lot of useful information here. I could probably generate most of this by hand by saying, yeah, this person knows those other nine people. Like, this is not actually a very exciting story. What's the color on this one? Um, I pick the color coding where the people who know the most. It's by number uh, it, It's by number. So the red is uh, no internal connections, and the blues and purples are the ones with the most, and green somewhere in between there. I mean, there's a tiny bit of extra data, right? Like. Some people know each other. And there's other ones that will try to intelligently clump these so that your high school friends and your college friends and your grad school friends and your work friends uh, will sort of emerge as clumps because there'll be local density of people who know a lot of each other in the same groupings. But, and that's a better story. But this, this is not a very good story. Um, there's other formats you'll see where instead of a big wheel, it's just a web. And that's almost worse um, because, because with no, uh, with no meaning applied to the placement of things, um, uh, you don't know where to look or what it means for something to be somewhere other than maybe there's a little bit of local clumping there. So uh, yeah, lots of fail there. This is a win. This is from, um, this is from the book. Um, Andrew Odewan did this. This is uh, graphs of the Senate voting. So this was the, um, well, okay, so any two senators have a connection if they voted together at least 65% of the time for the two year session. So this was the 91-93 um, uh, Senate. This was the state of the Senate uh, the year that Bill Clinton was elected president. And so there's really interesting things going on. You, you've, got, you've got some significant centrists, right? You've got the sort of the main clumps of Democrats, Republicans, and then you've got a few uh, outliers who were um, kind of off doing their own thing. <laughs> so this was the, this was the um, 102nd session. Uh, fast forward four years, in the intermediate two years, there was the uh, Newt Gingrich-led Young Republican Revolution thing. This was the state of the Senate when Bill Clinton was impeached. There is no connections, and only sort of one in the middle, and I forget who that is. Um, that's an interesting story. And then, and then as things continued over the next several years, you can see, for example, in the 105th uh, Senate, both parties have their sort of more extreme base in the back and their slightly more centrist front groups. Um, by, uh, by the 107th, there's a lot more going on uh, in terms of, of interaction, bipartisan, whatever. So when people say, things are worse than they used to be, things are better than they used to be, sometimes that's actually true. It's not just, oh, it always used to be bad. Go ahead. Sorry, the, the yellow numbers are? Um, um, I think the yellow ones may be independents or they may be people who changed. I don't remember, yeah. it's in the book. That'll get your free book. Uh, anyway, so so this so this is an interesting story. There's not a lot of data here, right? There's senators, there's party affiliation, and there's who they're connected to. It's not a very deep <clears throat> data set. He could have added how long they've been in the Senate and who they were taking campaign contribution money for and how many <coughs> votes they were present for or mail. None of that is relevant to this particular story, which is, what does the partisanship look like over the course of uh, a decade or more than a ba decade? Based on voting records. Based ba on voting records. <clears throat> is there some um, significance that 104, the red and blue spheres are closer together than they are in, let's say, 108? Um, does that mean that they're? Uh, <coughs> I, I, I think this is probably just a layout choice versus this. Um, this distance, like these, these uh, Gaps yeah, I are relevant. That in there. I just mean between the two. I don't know. Because it, it does seem to move. I don't know. Um, some of that may just be layout or the algorithm he was using, doing it a little bit arbitrarily. So. Um, there's also a few intentional things he's done here in terms of left and right and blue and red. And in fact, the reason that the numbers are uh, um, all catting up is here is because the original layout clumped them and he said, well, I want these to be left and right. So he rotated all the image. Uh, So, uh, and encode usefully. So that's the <coughs> story number three, encode usefully. And there's a whole, like I wrote like 90 pages on how to encode usefully, so we're not gonna get into all that today. But there's some interesting examples. So um, first why is placement. So placement is really valuable. Uh, you can learn a ton from a periodic table based on where the element you're looking at is placed because the rows and the columns have meaning. This is also why anything other than elements 
arranged in a periodic table is wrong, which I rant about in my chapter. Um, because because when you're putting your your uh, desserts or video game controllers or whatever else is into a periodic table, they're not actually periodic. And this format, going back to the first one of knowing your data, this format is beautiful because it reflects the structure of the underlying data that it is intended to represent. And when you pour some other flavor of data into it, the structure now becomes meaningless. In this case, um, the placement is enormously meaningful, right? Every row and column is unique, and it represents particular properties of that element. The other example I use on this particular uh, slide often is just a map of the United States. And you can say, uh, you could write out in prose the geographical relationships of all of the states. And it would be difficult to find the data you want, and it would take up a lot of space. Or you place them visually, and you can learn something about a state because you say, well, this is sort of an eastern state and a northern state, so I know some things. Or you can say, I'm looking in the south for southern states, and now I have, it allows me to narrow my search. So placement, enormously valuable, enormously useful, mostly ignored for a lot of um, visualizations, network or otherwise. This is a win. Here's another one. This is from a website called theyrule.net, which um, tracks uh, board members of probably the Fortune 500. I don't remember how many companies they do. It's not entirely up to date. I think this is from about 2006. Uh, again, very simple. There's only, there's only two properties. There's people and there's companies. Uh, there's a connection of on the board of. Um, the people do have uh, one uh, two-value property, which is male or female. I don't know if you can see the little figure here in the suit, the little figure here in the suit with the skirt. Uh, this is a very simple representation in terms of the graphic treatment, but it's very powerful in the story that it tells and the placement. So these are the these are seven people who are on the board of J.P. Morgan Chase, and you can see all of the companies that either they sit on the boards of or are linked by uh, one one board away, one route. The name there's a there's a number of these stored um, visualizations on the website that you can pick. This one's called Magnificent Seven. Uh, so there's a, there's, a, there's a huge amount of influence shared very closely of, of the social spheres of these seven people. Um, there's not even color in this, right? Not necessary because the, because the structure is the magic in this one. And, and most of the rest of what's going on doesn't need any more graphical treatment or exposition. So again, this is mostly about placement and, and, and just the connections that exist. Uh, and you could have you know centered this or mapped this in any kind of a way that made it a horrible knot. But because it was chosen to convey this particular message and, and based on this one particular company, this layout works really well. Did they exclude any board members who were not members of other boards? Like in that? I have no idea. No, they didn't. There's only seven on J.P. Morgan Chase. Because so, it looks like all of them are board members on other companies. Oh, very likely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. almost certainly. So, but the but the data set is. Um, or, or it was, these are the board members of this company, right? So if there's, if there's seven board members on the company, there's seven. If there's 10, there's 10. Um, so they didn't cherry pick that part. I don't know how they came up with this yeah. chart. So all, the other, other, all the other boards are on as well. So yeah. it's all yes. that, it's the whole fabric of yeah. and, and so you can go to this website, you can surf by company, you can yeah. start with an individual, you can save out your own maps, it's pretty cool. Right here. There's another, there's another one that uses the same engine, uh, I don't know if I can remember, I think it's called Exxon Secrets, that shows how oil companies fund think tanks which fund uh, climate researchers who say, oh no, there's no global warming. And like, there are no climate skeptics who are not funded by the oil companies. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just that simple, like, well, there's the money right there, it's very simple. Um, at, you know, like this level of simplicity. Uh, hmm? I know, shocked, right? <laughs> who would have thought? Um, yeah, anyway, so again, Layout, the structure, is the story here in this case. Uh, so this is one that just came out the other day. This is a huge map, and that's why it's cropped, because it was like enormous. This is um, uh, a conversation about the Mexican drug cartels and the influence that they have. And um, it's, it's kind of an epic piece of work. Um, and they've done a few things really well. The, um, the uh, size uh, indicates, I think, number of connections. And, the, and this is, I believe, the center. The center um, basically has sort of the, the largest diversity of different connections. And then as you get to the edge, you have smaller diversity of connections, which is related to, but not exactly the same as the number of connections. And these are either um, the names that start with NARC are 
drug trafficking part of the family, and the names that start with Thump are the public government agencies. Now, there's no other differentiation between them other than the text, which is a huge, horrible, absolutely inexcusable epic fail, right? Because you have these two fundamentally different organizations, and it'd be really easy to make them a different color, or a different shape, or in anything, so that when I'm looking, I can say, okay, this narcotic group has 12 little baby narcotic groups, and they're talking to five federal agencies. But you can't tell without reading the text on every one of these. Terrible, 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 terrible choice. Um, I'm a little disappointed in that. <laughs> when it says that it's showing the capacity for arbitrating information, what does that mean? Does it mean that there's a discovered payoff? Uh, I don't know if it's a what? payoff or just a communication link. But um, part of the story that goes with this is uh, the, the, the fingers and tentacles are so deep that you never know talking to an individual, talking to an organization, uh, if they're part of the, if they're related to the drug cartel or not, or how far away they are, or if I offend you, that he's going to come into my house tomorrow and kill me. But, right. but I would say that that data doesn't really show that. All it shows is some sort of arbitrary connection between a public servant and a narco center. Uh, pain pain. If I had read the article more closely, I would tell you what the connection was that they used yeah. for the standard for this. Um, I think it's based on another uh, research website, which I don't have off the top of my head, but um, I, I think there's a there's a incredible data source that's been gathering this information. So that's another thing is they certainly could have differentiated the links, the style of the links of whether there's uh, money, influence, uh, previous dealings, whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's um, yeah, not entirely a victory. Uh, speaking of that. You guys might have seen this in the New York Times, uh, maybe this spring. This was the this was kind of the last slide in a uh, presentation. Oh, yeah. So contracts contractors were yeah. uh, putting together for generals about the state of things in Afghanistan. <clears throat> and the response was, when we understand that, then we'll have won. Uh, and, 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 and it's it's a big mess. Um, to be fair, the point of this this was not presented slide one, this is slide 22 here, and each of these colored groups was presented and sort of constructed separately and they were combined. So the goal of this was for the contractors to represent the depth of their knowledge about the interconnectedness of all these different domains of what was going on. Uh, and, and to a degree that they have done that. Um, I think also, uh, that was a nice start, but but again, fundamentally, it's a really poor representation visually. That um, other than these other than these color coded categories, which is not a bad start, uh, the the nodes are completely undifferentiated from one another, which means you have to again get a magnifying glass and come in and read one of these to understand what you're talking about. And the links are completely undifferentiated, right? Um, there's, there's a significant delay here, right? <laughs> we know that we have some delays. Like, for example, would there be another graph that would show? U.S. funding for Afghanistan and where the funding goes, how much for popular oh, support, not how public. much, what's that? <laughs> I said it's probably not public if there's, um, so th th there's, there, clearly whoever put this together has a lot of knowledge and the goal of this was not to convey much of that knowledge, it was just to represent that the knowledge exists, which I guess you could say is a success if that was the only goal, but um, presumably you could have done, it could have been done better. Unless the underlying message is to say we're fucked. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's right. I mean, that's the, that, that's the takeaway, like it or not. I yeah. uh, well, so get to, 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 to that point, the underlying message. Um, oh. So this was um, this was from the, the, the first big wave of, right, I see people like shaking their heads and cringing. This is from the first wave of, of Wall Street scandal. Um, the Martha Stewart wave, not the more recent wave. And, the small wave. Yeah. And this is from a website called Wall Street Follies. And um, it's kind of a brilliant piece of satire, right? Like, to, to the point of the previous one, wow, look what a huge mess everything is. Uh, because you can't understand a thing about this. And, uh, and I thought it was pretty good. Yeah. So this is obviously satire. Yeah. And that's obvious, but your previous one, like may or may not have seemed like some meaningfulness. But uh, there's kind of this idea, right? At least I remember reading. I can't remember what article that 
you know, a complex data visualization or complex graphs are kind of could be steered towards their audience. So ought to be. In that, yeah, mm -hmm. ought to be. So in that, if it takes you 30 minutes to stare at a data visualization to understand it, there could be an argument that the person who created that intended it to be that way in such a manner that they only wanted the people who were willing to stare at it for 30 minutes to understand it. Yeah. And if you didn't, weren't willing to take that step to actually invest the time to understand it. So I don't mean this one, obviously this is satire, but the previous one, there's probably people much smarter. Who or are at least more topically, to problem, topically aware, yeah. Yeah, than we are and can understand it. And I don't, all politics are moved, like they understand, they can look at that and go, within 10 minutes, I understand it. And it's meant to be that way. Um, yeah, I would say that maybe it, it shouldn't necessarily be a, a punitive action that only those strong survive to understand. But it is. But it's reasonable if your audience is brain surgeons that you can use some specialized knowledge and specialized context that that audience is going to pick up on much more quickly than a general population. Um, to your point about this being satire, that was actually my next point. So I was looking at diagrams on the internet because I do that for fun sometimes because that's the kind of nerd I am. And. Um, I came across a website full of really, really terrible, painfully, painfully, painfully bad uh, diagrams, like drawn with the PowerPoint draw tool, like that was claimed. And I'm flipping through the pages of this site with all these horrible visualizations, and this was one of them. And um, this was the same guy, this was his sincere effort back in the day. And I had thought it was satire, and I'm not any more convinced that it is. It might actually be a really incompetent, really sincere effort. <laughs> um, and there's like all kinds of badness going on here. Um, I mean, we talked about placement and the value of placement, and so now we can talk a little bit about uh, the nodes and the links. You want them to be consistent, because people will assume that if they see um, a link that means a particular thing because it's blue that the next time they see a blue link. Like, like our brains are really good pattern matching machines, right? And we use this to predict the future. This is what language is. This is what all kinds of learning is. And we say, I've seen that pattern before. And the next time I see it, I believe the behavior I'm going to encounter is the same behavior I encountered the last time I saw this pattern. So um, this is so, inconsistency is bad. This is the worst version. This is semi-consistent. Because you see a little tiny bit of a something, you say, oh, OK, I understand. Um, yellow, this is people. Martha Stewart, Martha's friend, daughter. Great, OK. Uh, and then yellow. Right? Yeah, except for Sam. He's, I guess and these, these are people, too, and they're not really yellow. And um, Well, there's some yellow people. Like, it's only partially consistent. So you think you learned, and then it kicks you. Um, this is really, this is epically bad. What's that? There's no appropriate scaling. I mean, yeah. Worldcom and Enron had yeah. far greater impact like on the economy. all economy. wrong, right? The, the nodes are wrong. The links are wrong. I mean, they're basically differentiated only to provide differentiation. But you can't take any meaning from what the relationship was. Um, yeah, lots of extra badness going on here. Uh, don't do this. If you're building social media products or any kind of network products, don't do it like that. Um, <laughs> seem to be kind of graded on the density of information. And it was very different than the way that yeah. we would prepare a presentation. I, I, I have heard this about um, about Japanese PowerPoint, that their goal is like more more text per page wins. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's actually what I saw. I thought, I wonder if the guy was Japanese. No. Because there's just so much dense information. Yeah, unfortunately not. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna segue out of this and put my put my two more samples on the screen. This is gonna take me just a minute here, um, but uh, it'll be worth it. I promise. Um, so uh, the question earlier was, what about um, what about intentionally misleading representations? So, org chart of the House Democrats' health care plan. <laughs> Source, Joint Economic Committee Republican staff. So, that alone tells you a fair bit about this diagram, right? Um, I mean, it's brutal, right? This is, this is, I mean, what do you notice about this first thing? <laughs> Too many bureaus. 
lots of bureaus, lots of really bright colors kind of screaming for your attention. Uh, in this culture, we tend to start in the upper left corner, um, which is all about taxes, and red, right? This is fear here. Um, poor Surgeon General is kind of lost in the middle of this. Um, but the relevant part, the important part here is, here's me, I'm the consumer, right? And there's my doctor. And between my doctor and I is the entire federal government. <laughs> which isn't entirely accurate, right? I mean, I'm really glad the Labor Department is training nurses. I believe in nurses, that's a good thing. But that's not actually part of the story. Because the story that they're telling is not, here's what, it, here's what the structure is going to be like when you need to go get health care. The story they're telling is, be afraid. And this is, um, this is not like, this is not subtly, oops. Um, this is not like subtly broken, this is really intentionally broken. So like, if you look at like this number of zigzags, this red one goes like, going the long way around so we can cross these a couple extra times. Um, totally intentional, right? It takes more effort to do this wrong than it does to do it right. <laughs> but there's an underground sewer pipe that goes over to your nerves. Well, <laughs> secret, secret um, uh, There's yeah. a sewer pipe. Healthcare, goods right and services, right white nurse. thing at the bottom. Yeah, right, consumer to the nurse. Oh, yeah. non-literal sewer pipe. But, but you know, uh, there's this whole health insurance exchange. I'm pretty sure that I'm actually in the room with, me with my doctor, but that's what it looks like here, right? Um, this whole thing, this whole little cluster here that goes and eventually connects back, uh, Health and Human Services, that's fine. Uh, none of this is relevant. It doesn't need to be on the screen here. This could be anywhere else. But again, it's included to add bulk and to add noise to the image. Um, this is a really fun little zigzag. This is a chain of four so the little zigzags here and the extra hops and everything. Um, again, not connected to anything else except for the Treasury Department. It doesn't need to be interwoven that way. But it's done that for punitive value, to make the whole thing look more complicated, more incomprehensible, uh, more painful and unworkable and bureaucratic and unwieldy. This is the newer version. <laughs> because that wasn't scary enough. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is... Uh, Patient protection, affordable care, blah, 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 prepared for joint economic committee, Republican staff, congressman, blah, blah, blah. So notice the headings, right? New government, expanded government, right? All the new relationships. Like, this is, I mean, this is months worth of effort. It looks like a diagram of a printed circuit board. This is a month's worth of effort, and the message is, this is too complicated, you won't understand it. So wouldn't this fall in the category of intentionally misleading? Oh, completely. Oh, without question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, that's the point. Right, this is a propaganda piece, this is not an information piece. Uh, so the Democrats come back with one that simplifies? Um, there was a graphic designer that, that, that put one out that was a little simpler, uh, a simpler version of this one that wasn't bad. I actually looked at, at redoing this one and I got all the nodes and connections in place um, and did not go bother to take the time to re-encode the colors. And, <laughs> and what happens is it turns out if you have the consumer and the doctor and the things that are, um, you know, the employers, you get about 15% on the edge of the map and the rest of it's not connected. I mean, it's connected up here. But, but this, this path of the health insurance interchange, the doctor's providers, it's not actually that much content <coughs> of relative to the, the whole thing. So um, yeah, like some, some graphic designer got paid you know, for a month of poking around an illustrator to put this together. I have no idea if it's accurate. It's not really the point. Um, but it sure is impressive and scary. So that's, uh, that's the point. So are there any particular techniques for learning how to do this? Because apparently there's a market for it. <laughs> <laughs> you learn how to do it right, so crazy. and then you invert the hierarchy. You have to sacrifice a copy of Tufty's book, Beautiful Evidence, okay. under the full moon. Yeah. And so, I mean, so like, I mean, like this very intentionally, like this one is, is pretty easy to call out. The colors are bad. The relationships are stretched across instead of being local. Um, you know, the highlights, the all, I mean, there's just a lot going on that very intentionally you have to go out of your way to make more wrong, right? These are intentional choices that are intentionally worse than, than accident, than arbitrary bad choices. So, yeah, you know what you're doing and you invert that. I mean, just like, it's just like any propaganda. It's the same communication skills applied in the other direction. So, uh, that's mostly... Interesting. There we go. Mostly what I got. And that's the end. So, um, I blog infrequently. I tweet moderately frequently, but often about not this. But sometimes. 
Um, and I have email. Um, I'm totally interested in fun visualization projects. I'm freelancing these days, so if you have an interesting visualization project, let me know. Uh, if you're interested in the book, um, there's coupons from O'Reilly, discount coupons here. We have about 10 copies. I'm going to give a couple of these away to the people who ask good questions. There's about 10 more copies that Jess is going to do a drawing for. So right over here by John, if you, John, if you wave. Uh, there's things you can fill out, and, right. and there's about uh, 10 copies. I guess I could sign them before we go. Um, my business cards are here. If there's more questions, it's not too late to win a book. Are we going to vote on the book winners? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a good question on the question. It's up, it's up to vote. <laughs> <book. laughs> Okay. I'm not doing it actually. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. That's in the queue. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, what was that uh, site of sad diagrams? Um, I don't even know off the top of my head. Uh, it, it's 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 not. It's like it's 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 even worse. Like it's not even worth. <laughs> uh, we, we can talk about it later. It's really bad. Do you have any favorite um, data visualization software? I use um, I use OmniGraphle on the Mac, which is the best thing ever for uh, smaller collections of data. Um, for a little bit bigger collections, uh, so I told you I was a Perl regular expression hacker for five years. So uh, I munch my data in Perl and dump it into the dot format, um, which is the native format that the Graph is layout engine uses. OmniGraphle also will read dot format and, and do a first approximation uh, using graph is for that. Um, for bigger data sets, for more interactivity, for animation, that kind of thing, uh, I would recommend um, uh, Protoviz, which is free software out of, oh man, I can't remember if it's Stanford or Berkeley. And if you went to either of those schools, you hate me now. Um, uh, uh, processing is also a really good one, and there's like five others. There's um, Nodebox and Flare, and if you're already a, Python programmer or a JavaScript programmer or a Flash programmer, you can find one that suits the language that, you're, that you prefer. But um, I would say Protoviz and Processing are probably the top two. Protoviz is all, um, it's all JavaScript HTML5, so that is the wave of the future, and the Flash stuff is kind of the wave of the past, unless you use Internet Explorer, in which case HTML5 is a little too far in the future. But um, any modern browser will be just fine with whatever you create in <laughs> That's what it's called, man. Modern browsers, not Internet Explorer, right? Chrome works, Safari works, Firefox works. Um, those are the two that I would start with. Look at. I have two questions. Yeah. The first one is, what do you get if you ask a bad question? And then the second one. <laughs> 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 the second one we have a book of graphs for dummies over here. The, Go ahead. the second one is the things that you call an epic fail. Um, is, it, is that your opinion of what an effective visualization is? Does that take into account yeah, the whole thing's what you're trying to gain? You know what I mean? Like, if it was that previous diagram. Oh yeah, that one was very successful, right? That one very effectively achieved what their goal was. Regardless of whether I agree or disagree with the goal, okay. that one did a really good job of what they intended to do. Some of these other ones, like the music download one, made it harder to understand that data. The Mexican drug cartel one was a really good start, but they could have done a few things to make it much more useful, much more understandable. So that was, they fell short of what would not have been much more work to achieve much greater, much greater hospital, much greater benefit. So you had a lot of really bad examples. Do you have any that are phenomenal, or great? Um, or, like this is the best example of data visualization I've ever seen. Those are a lot harder to find, honestly. Um, <laughs> for sure, yeah. I mean, yeah, that was pretty good. That was not as So, okay, a word on Tufty because everybody asks me. Tufty's a really good gateway drug. Um, he's not as good as he says he is. Um, he's really shallow. So, like, what he has to say is very limited. It's not very rigorous. It's not very academic. And it doesn't actually get you very far when you have a blank page. Um, a lot of the contributors uh, to the, in, in this book have done really good work. There's a lot of people online who are doing really good work. Um, a lot of it is, is pretty data intensive, so if you're not into the topic, it's, it's less useful. Um, but but there's, there's good stuff. Most of the stuff that gets reblogged among all the data viz blogs is not so great, honestly. Because um, it's, it's, uh, it's either way too heavy off the data end and there's no story being told, or it's really pretty graphic designery and there's no data involved. 
And this mental path of, I have an audience, and I'm trying to teach them something, is a hard thing to do. And, and the intersection of those skill sets is, is, is less common. Have you seen uh, the medic groups? Uh, Hans Gosling, I think is his name, now. Uh, Rosling. Rosling. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Gatliner. Yeah, Gatliner. That's yeah, a, that's a, that's pretty good stuff. Thing. Pretty good stuff. And this temporal. Yeah. And and, and the reason that he wins is because he sets up the story and says, "Here's what we're going to see. We're going to see Southeast Asia going from very poor to being very successful and even surpassing Eastern Europe in terms of lifespan." So he's a very good storyteller, and his his visualization is not very sophisticated, but it's very successful. And those should not be confused. Right, because we've seen some very sophisticated things yeah. that are not very successful. Well, it gives you good sensitivity. I was like, and it's developing also, world spending on education, and you see right. what happens to yeah. those countries. Yeah, that do it tells a story. Of those he knows exactly what he's telling you. Yeah. Go ahead. So there's lots of different ways to like, separate data out with like, uh, colors and shapes, yeah. and distances, and yeah. Some facing the stuff, are there things that people tend to overuse in wrong ways or underuse yes. in proper ways? Yeah, um, people underuse placement all the time. Like there was almost none in here where placement was, was, was used well. Um, and, there's, and, it's, and there's so much value, I normally have like five slides about that. Of, of it, it, gives you, it gives you meta information about everything on the page and you don't have to use any ink to get there other than saying, I've defined axes, they exist. If it's on that side, you get that value and that's a really powerful thing, and it's mostly underused. Um, color is very often used wrong. So a lot of things, we have we have very powerful software built into our brains. Um, you can't help but see when this line is thicker than that line, or this box is bigger than that box. Like, you can't not see that. If there's all blue nodes on a screen and one of them is red, you don't have to examine every one and compare. You say, that one's different. Like, you can't not see that. It's built into your brain. Um, so some things are naturally ordered, like thickness and size and length. Uh, color is not naturally ordered. We have social conventions around color, but they're but it's not naturally ordered. So when you see a weather map that goes from red to green, that's uh, that's a cultural convention, but it's not a it's not a um, there's not an inherent meaning in that spectrum. So um, you can do it like if there's a map that's like um, altitude goes from like white at sea level and gets darker and darker brown as you go up in the mountains and darker and darker blue down in the ocean. That's fine. You have two gradients, two separate gradients, but when you go from uh, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, uh, that's, a, that's a cultural convention that's not built into the brain. And so that ordering um, is, is usually wrong. So there was a few of these. Um, the Afghanistan map did it okay because the colors were not ordered. So it's, it's great to separate things with color. It's a powerful differentiator, but, um, but it shouldn't be used for ordering. The uh, Facebook friend wheel, that was used for ordering. Right, where the red had the least number of connections, the green had the most, and it went through the spectrum on the way out. Have you seen like a, a natural, like for people, the number of different pieces that you use like of that before people become confused? So you could have color and size and, and shape and all these different pieces, and at some point, do you, is there a limit? Uh, yeah. It depends on how many, depends on how many targets are on the page. It depends on how differentiated they are. It depends on how many properties. You can do things like redundantly encode with position and color and size to reinforce each other, and that makes it easier. Um, if you're using each of these different properties, visual properties to encode different meaning, um, it, it gets trickier the more you add. Wait, wait. Hang on, there was questions over here and you guys jumped in. Go ahead. I was just curious, do you think there is going to be a social responsibility or an ethic that would standards compliance moving forward in this? I just look at the Wall Street. Not, not possible. It's, it's not I mean, no more, than, no, no more than with writing. But it, even with the government entities and some of these big things, I mean, for something like that to confuse a whole room of smart people, I feel like... Have you seen Fox News? <laughs> I mean, I'm not joking, yeah. right? No, you can't my question that. is, I mean, there's no possible standards compliance moving forward with these types of things. Um, w within a very specific industry, you might, right? So somebody may say, we're going to propose a, uh, a new standard for entity relationship diagrams where placement is meaningful. And if you want to use our tools and you want to, you know, conform to our ISO, you can do that. But um, in, for general use, no. I mean, there's, there's no value in it for everybody who has something to gain by manipulating the system. No, actually, there are initiatives that are in Washington, D.C. 
mentioned Fox News. My, my question is, what news organizations have you noticed doing a good job with data visualization? Uh, the New York Times stuff is pretty good. Um, occasionally really excellent. Um, uh, good Magazine has a lot of InfoViz stuff. Sometimes it's sometimes they're really good and often they're kind of mundane. They tend to be more designery. Um, I mean, the New York Times are beautifully designed, but they're, uh, they do a great job. Um, that, the, the, off the top of my head, that's the ones uh, that, that do the best jobs. If you remember, I um, uh, think back to like 1997 and Wired Magazine before they sold out, and they had a section called Info Porn at the beginning that had you know three and four dimensional graphs with color and 3D, and they were kind of a little overdone, but they were actually pretty decent. I mean, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say they were aesthetically good, but they they made good choices in terms of the knowledge representation. Since we did the data visualization. Google Maps overlays and GSI data overlays, or is it more of the um, Sometimes. <laughs> no example. Uh, the classic one's the open time spotting map. Uh, there's a there's a there's a mashup that I've used called uh, Housing Maps for plots from Craigslist rental listings on a Google Map. I mean, it's, it's, they're good, but it's it, that, 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 that's, that's all the same classic problem. How yeah. about oh, well, we get one more question? Yeah, I mean, I'll give you yeah, out. There, there, were some, there were some good questions, so don't leave. If you asked a question, I'll give you a book. The book, the book allocation, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know if all those questions got a bunch of that. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody wants, oh, arbitra if anybody, arbitrary line on the If anybody isn't getting a book and would like a book, sign up over there. Just put your name on the card and we'll draw. Sorry, Is there some ceiling for <clears throat> information vectors, at which point the visualization becomes non useful anymore? Let's say you're putting age, gender, location, etc. I mean, how many? Um, so, at what point is there too many? The way, the way it works is, is the, more, uh, the more data there is on the page, the longer it takes to find the bit that you want. Like, you can measure this. This is, this is pretty easy to do. Um, similarly, uh, as, as, as was asked before, uh, the more different layers of differentiation. So if you have all blue on the map um, and one red dot, that's easy to find. And if you have all blue and a few red and all squares and a few circles and um, all with a heavy border but a few with a skinny border, the more different factors that you put in and cross multiply, then you lose that instant recognition ability because you have to now, now you do have to end your search. Um, and that does slow you down. So once you get past two or three, uh, you, you lose that super quick find. So you call like, is three like the golden rule? Oh, no, no, no. I mean, no. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know a number off the top of my head. There's probably research been done on that. Um, you can put way more than six properties onto a page. Like the, the, the Menard map's about six. It's fine, but there's a miles worth of room. I did diagrams in grad school that had six without even, without even trying. Um, different because you use placement and you use labels and you use uh, line relationships and you use color and I mean there's already four or five right there and, and we haven't even gotten into shape and we haven't even gotten into you know dotted line versus solid line and all the other things. There's, there's lots of there's lots of properties. blur like angle like there's a there's a bunch of bunch of properties. Seems like a topic for the next book. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, there, how there, many properties can you actually put into a diagram uh, before it crosses over the line? Go look go look up um, Colin Ware wrote uh, a big textbook and then a shorter newer book that, that dives uh, pretty heavily into the visual system, but then also all the practical implications of a number of different properties and which ones are, are pre and all that. How do you W A R E. So I think for a couple, we'll, we'll probably do, um, so first, thank you, Noah. Yay. Second, we recorded this, so we're going to post